At the end of 2019, a novel coronavirus emerged in Wuhan, China, and infected person after person, and quickly went from an outbreak into an epidemic throughout China. By the new year, cases of the infection began to emerge in clusters around the world, and in February, we gave the disease caused by the novel coronavirus a name. In March, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, and within a month, it arguably became the leading cause of death in the United States, displacing both heart disease and cancer from the number one and two spots, killing 1,800 Americans almost every day. Globally, the coronavirus has infected more than 2.5 million people in 177 countries and has killed at least 177,000. By this time, the United States was the country with the most reported cases, with New York City as the epicenter of the country's outbreak. When we take a closer look at some of the reported cases in New York City, 62 years was the median age of those people who were infected, with a little over 60% of this cohort being male. This data comes from a retrospective case series of 393 adults with COVID-19 who were admitted to two New York City hospitals. Not surprisingly, these people presented with symptoms which were largely similar to those seen in the large case series from China. Cough and fever were the most common symptoms, followed by shortness of breath and body aches. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting were also fairly common. Many of these patients also had laboratory abnormalities. Lymphopenia was especially common, even when total white blood cell count varied. For example, 90% of these patients had some degree of lymphopenia, compared to leukocytosis or leukopenia, which were only reported in 15% of cases. Many of these patients also had elevated liver function values and inflammatory markers. Out of the 393 patients that were admitted for COVID-19, 130 of them developed respiratory failure, leading to invasive mechanical ventilation. These patients were also more likely to need vasopressor support and were more likely to suffer from other complications, including atrial arrhythmias and new renal replacement therapy. Many in this group that appeared to develop a more severe clinical course were more likely to be male, were obese, and had elevated liver function values and inflammatory markers. As of April 17th, only 43 of these patients had been extubated. In total, 40 out of the 393 of the patients who were admitted for COVID-19 had died. 260 had been discharged from the hospital, with the outcome data being incomplete for the remaining 93 patients. Overall, it's reassuring to see the majority of COVID-19 patients being discharged from the hospital. And as of today, New York City, along with many other places around the world, appear to be reaching a plateau or even seeing a declining number of COVID-19 cases, which is hopefully a glimpse into a healthier future. But there are still many problems to solve and important questions that we don't have the answer to, such as when and will there be a dedicated treatment or vaccine? Also, will there be a second wave? And if so, how will our deprived economy and already overwhelmed healthcare system tolerate another wave of critically ill patients? Predicting when and exactly how this pandemic will end seems to be anyone's guess, but will depend in part on how we as individuals behave in the interim. If we scrupulously protect ourselves and our loved ones, more of us will live. If we underestimate the virus, it will find us.